In this video, um, I'm going to go over the uh, the scientific method, uh, the scientific method, and the the steps that are involved in the scientific method. And uh, I kind of dislike this term uh, because saying the scientific method makes it sound like there's this one particular way that scientists always uh, approach things. They always do it in this order, and, that, and that's not necessarily true. Scientists don't sit down and say, oh, what are the, the five steps of the scientific method? And let me start with step one. I will make some observations. And step two, I'll generate a hypothesis. Um, it's going to have probably more variation than that in the real world, but it is generally a good uh, model for getting an idea of how scientists think and how they go through uh, this process. Um, so step one, step one is to make some observations, or I'll just say to observe. And, uh, and these can be just casual. And you'll see I'll contrast that with more systematic observations later on. These are just casual or, or informal, informal observations. And th this is the term your textbook uses. I actually like to call this, uh, I used to like to call this just coming up with a question. You're just questioning things. An example that I really like is a very famous physicist by the name of Richard Feynman uh, was sitting in a cafeteria one day and just casually, uh, not meaning to observe anything, just casually sitting there watching what was going on, he notices this guy throw a plate up in the air. Uh, he was messing around, throws this plate up in the air, and Feynman notices something about how the plate is wobbling. And as a physicist, he gets just playful and curious about why that's the case. And it sets him off on this, this sequence of uh, questioning things and, and trying out different ideas and uh, formulas. And eventually, uh, in many ways, is, is, is the, uh, what leads him to the work that gets him the Nobel Prize in physics. So a lot of the time, uh, science just gets started by somebody noticing something, wondering something about the world and why it's working that way. Uh, the example they use in the textbook is, is pretty good, actually. They talk about um, uh, people seem more depressed. Seem more depressed in winter than in summer. And so that's, that's you're wondering, why is that the case? Uh, the second step is you're going to come up with a hypothesis. So you're going to hypothesize. And a, a hypothesis, let me just put this off to the side here, a hypothesis is essentially just a, a possible, a possible or we could say tentative explanation. So you're just saying, well, maybe this is the reason. You are being tentative about it in the sense that you're very open, at least ideally, you are very open to the idea that it's wrong and that there is some other explanation that's correct. So you're just, you're just throwing out some ideas. Now, you might have very good reasons for those ideas, or they might really just be guesses, uh, depending on what else you know about, about what's going on. Um, so some examples of hypotheses, and by the way, that's the plural. If you have more than one, it's a, it, you would say hypotheses. So some examples of some hypotheses would be, uh, we might say, oh, I think um, there's, there's more illness. There's more illness in the winter. I know that, you know, there's a lot more uh, viruses and, and, and other uh, germs going around. So I think that the increased illness is causing people to just be more gloomy. It's a bummer to get a cold. Um, there are also uh, longer periods of darkness in the winter, right? There's longer period, periods, sorry, my pen is spazzing out there, periods of darkness. So that's an alternative hypothesis. And often there are many different possible explanations. Um, so maybe 
increased hours of darkness in the winter, longer nights, in other words, maybe that's what's causing depression. Okay, so I have these possible explanations. Uh, the next thing I, I'm going to do with them is I'm going to want to I'm going to want to test them. Um, before I test them, I need to kind of see where they lead. What would be true if my hypothesis is correct? What what would the implications be? In other words, what can I predict? And so you're going to make predictions. You're going to try to predict if this is true. There's something that's going to be going on out there in the world, and you know. There's good predictions and there's bad predictions. Obviously, your prediction needs to be something that you can actually observe. It needs to be observable, right? If you're making some prediction about something that's going on 50 billion light years from Earth and there's no technology we have that can possibly detect it, well, that's not a you know very useful prediction in terms of, of actually doing some research to find out. So it should be observable. It should be testable. We should be able to actually check whether or not this prediction is correct. Another characteristic of a good prediction is how can I put this? We want the we want the prediction we, we want our hypothesis to generate some prediction that doesn't have alternative explanations. So we predict one particular thing and we can't come up with any other reasons why that would happen except for our our proposed explanation. In other words, there aren't alternative explanations that can also account for what we're seeing. Preferably, it, it doesn't always happen that way. There's often, you know, often a scientist will say, I, I've, I've discovered why this thing is happening. I have my hypothesis. I made this prediction. The prediction was true. My hypothesis is correct. Someone else will come along and say, well, actually, the predictions that you observed, those also fit my hypothesis, which is very different from yours. And so then we have to do some more work to, to try to uh, disentangle those. Uh, but, you know, some examples of this would be following along with our example of depression. Um, let's say that our, our hypothesis that we chose was the, uh, was the idea of longer periods of darkness causing depression. We decide we're going to test that one first. And so um, we might look at different cities. So, for example, in Phoenix, Arizona, right, it's very sunny, so we would expect uh, we would expect in Phoenix there to be lower, lower levels of depression, right? And then we might look at some place um, in like Scandinavia or something. Uh, uh, let's say let's say we look at Helsinki, right? During the winter time, the winter time, Helsinki, and um, and we would expect there to be much higher rates of depression because the winters there. Whoops, my pen keeps doing that. Uh, the winters there. Uh, the nights are much longer during the winter. So we would expect there to be higher rates of depression. And there are other ways we could do this um, that might be better. Um, if we have the time and the money, uh, we might be able to uh, actually say go into, I think in the textbook they say, you know, you could go into a dormitory and you could install brighter light bulbs on one floor and darker light bulbs on the other. And then you would predict, of course, that the floor with the brighter light bulbs, the students are going to be less depressed. Okay, so once we have our predictions, uh, the next two steps are maybe a little bit more obvious. Um, we have our predictions. We have to go out there and, and actually check to see if the predictions are true. In, in your book, it's, it talks about making observations, which you are. Um, this sounds like step number one, right? Because there we were observing as well. But in this case, you're making observations, you know, back in, in, in step number one, we were doing it in an informal, casual way, just to kind of come up with ideas, come up with things that we're wondering about. Uh, in this case, we are observing uh, with the objective of testing. We are trying to test the prediction. We are trying to test the hypothesis to see if it is correct. Um, we're, it, you know, we're really trying to hammer on this thing in the sense that we're trying to, we're trying to set it up in a way where if our hypothesis is wrong, the test will show that. That's sort of the ideal. And so we want, um, we want our observations to be, we want it to be systematic. And what I mean by that will become more clear as we go through the book. But the idea is we're trying to create a, a sort of formal, um, you might say planned, planned system or method that we're going to go through that allows us to be objective. Objective. 
And by objective, what we mean is free from bias. We want the results of our test not to be influenced by what we're hoping is true or what we are expecting to be true. And that's why we need this very carefully planned out systematic way of doing it. And that's kind of what, you know, the bulk of research methods is about. You, know, you don't really need research methods to make some observ casual observations, come up with some ideas, uh, you know, formulate a possible explanation. Um, you, maybe you start to get into it with trying to create some really good predictions, but where you really get into the meat of research methods is with this testing phase. This is where we're actually going to go out and collect the data and try to see if what we, uh, what we predicted is true. Okay, so then the last, uh, the last step is you've got your data, you've made your test, you, you pull all your, in, your, your, your data together and you evaluate it. You evaluate it or you could say analyze the data to try to come up with some kind of a conclusion about what it means. And by the way, I'm using somewhat different titles for these steps than in the book, uh, mostly just to try to abbreviate them. They have very long names for this uh, to try to sort of simplify and abbreviate these down. Um, but when you are when you are evalu evaluating or analyzing your results, um, the results can basically come out in one of these ways. One is they could support they could support your hypothesis. Um, we don't tend to say that they prove the hypothesis because that implies that we're absolutely certain. And one thing that we'll see about science is that we're rarely certain about things. We usually have a certain level of a certain level of certainty, a certain probability that the thing is true. Um, so for example, if we find that yeah, people are happier in all of the uh, all of the sunnier cities. Or we installed a light bulb, uh, on, uh, brighter light bulbs on a particular floor in the dormitory, and the students on that floor are happier. That supports our hypothesis, but there's still other things that could potentially explain those results. So we're not 100% sure that the hypothesis is true. Um, if if we go out there and test it, and we just see no relationship between uh, the amount of light and depression, then we might be able to say, um, we might be able to say that we have refuted, refuted or rejected or disproved, possibly, um, disproved the hypothesis. It's often more uh, easier in science to conclusively prove that something isn't true than it is to prove conclusively that it is true. Um, and we'll, we'll get into more detail about that later on. Uh, and then of course, you know, this is a, a sort of sad truth about research that we often get results that are inconclusive. And this is sort of the um, classic disappointing thing that happens to graduate students doing research is they have this beautiful hypothesis that they've come up with. They do all this time uh, formulating it and, and developing it and arguing for why it's true or you know possibly true and they go out there and they and they test it and they something goes wrong with the study and they get results that are they don't really say one way or the other um, so for example in this case maybe uh, we measure the students depression after we install these light bulbs uh, and we see no relationship between light and depression uh, there's there doesn't seem to be one um, but rather than refuting the hypothesis maybe we look at things a little more closely and we find out that there was something wrong with the way we measured depression. Maybe, for example, we find that uh, the, the depression questionnaire was in English and there happened to be a lot of exchange students on that floor of the dormitory. And so uh, there was a large percentage of students maybe who, who didn't know how to respond properly or misinterpreted certain questions. Um, so though all those kinds of things uh, can happen. And in that case, what you would want to do is you'd kind of go back to uh, square one, you'd uh, reevaluate your techniques, your methods, and you'd probably have to conduct further research to try to get at what was happening.